um, down to sort of the mac more micro level of how actually racism shows up uh, on a campus like UCSF. So it's my pleasure to share with you about what we're doing on our campus. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and we are on the Ohlone land here in San Francisco. Um, so with that, I have no additional disclosures um, and I want to um, start off just by talking a bit about what we're going to, what we've been doing at UCSF relative to our history as it relates to social justice initiatives and a process that I call our continuous equity uh, evolving uh, as an institution, how we've de developed a strategic plan to, to look holistically at our campus, at the institutions uh, within the campus and how racism shows up in various aspects of that and how do we go about dismantling it. And then with our new imperative, with the call to action that the nation heard, and then a little bit about our specific anti-racism initiative. So the Office of Diversity and Outreach that I um, am the inaugural vice chancellor for celebrates uh, 10 years uh, in this um, role. And we have been privileged at UCSF, however, to have a very long history of initiatives that really paved the way for the work that we have been able to accomplish over the course of the last 10 years. You know, I recognize that, um, you know, my work stands on the shoulders of others who have come before me and I'm uh, acutely aware of their contributions and their sacrifices in order for, um, for what we were able to do and for my opportunity to even serve as a, a student and as a resident um, at UCSF. Back in the 1960s, UCSF's Black and Latinx um, staff members came together to form um, the Black Caucus. And the Black Caucus um, was a group of mostly janitors and individuals that worked in the cafeteria who in 1968 at UCSF in San Francisco still had to go to the basement in order to have their own lunch or to use the bathroom. And they named themselves the basement people. Well, the basement people came together and said, you know, this is enough with this. And they went on strike and they went on strike both for their own rights and privileges, but also for the fact that they wanted black and brown children or you know, adults to have access to the educational opportunities that are afforded at UCSF. And so I, I honor and recognize their, their contributions. Phil Lee um, was our chancellor at the time and he had desegregated hospitals in the South as a result of working at Health and Human Services and the rollout of Medicare. And he came to UCSF as our chancellor at the time and, and UCSF was known uh, then as the plantation on the hill. So we, hit, we have this history, we share this history with our new students at orientation to, to, to say that we're proud of advocacy from our staff and from our learners that has really pushed the institution forward. Uh, central uh, to that work was in the HIV world in which we were leaders across the country and moving forward. And then in a, our students have similarly kept us uh, on track and really were the impetus for the formation of the Office of Diversity and Outreach when they um, had a die-in as it relates to um, Black Lives Matter and really pushed us forward. And we formed an additional intensive initiative in the School of Medicine around differences, differences matter. So again, on this road, we continue to try to move our campus towards greater equity, towards greater inclusion. And ultimately, our goal is to have belonging, right? Such that all members of our campus community um, have equity, they, there is equity there. They're included in that there's not just a, a pop of color, but in fact, people are at the table being heard, um, being listened to and leading uh, in our institution. And this is the ultimate goal that we're seeking um, for our, our staff, our learners, and for the patients that we care for. So when we set about to develop a strategic plan of moving our institution forward, our thoughts were um, that we needed something that was holistic in nature, that in fact, this is, um, there are years of, of standard practices that in and of themselves provide a lot of barriers to full diversity 
uh, and full equity, and that we had an obligation to both support and build pathway and pipeline programs into our institution, but then make sure that in fact, we have an institution that is um, ready for the level of diversification, that in fact, there's a climate where people acknowledge and recognize equity and inclusion. And that ab above all of that, we have systems in place to assure that we are accountable, an accountable organization, and that there is a compliance foundation for our campus. So the climate issues are one that we want to measure and, and take measure of um, with some regularity. And our faculty climate task force, um, we've, we've been looking at over time how the faculty perceive being at UCSF. Our overall campus task force looked at uh, climate using a, a survey tool developed by Rankin at Associates. And some of the data we know about our own campus that is that almost half of 40% of our underrepresented minority faculty report discrimination because of race and, and ethnicity. A third um, have faced unequal treatment at every level within the department, within the school. Uh, that's a compared to 10% of, of uh, majority individuals. While the 36% of our white faculty and 37% of the Asian faculty believe that UCSF effectively promotes a climate that's free of racial discrimination. That's a view held by only 23% of our underrepresented minority faculty. So there is a perception gap um, between how others think that um, minorities are navigating UCSF and the actual experience of underrepresented groups in navigating UCSF. Uh, in our environment, 16% of our entire campus community of about 30,000 people reported in our climate survey that they have a disability. And that 67% of those who identified as having a disability report that they were actually comfortable with our climate for inclusion, but it's lower than the 77% of people who uh, don't have disabilities. So there's also some, some challenges there. So based on data and trying to use a data-driven strategy, we sought to in improve um, our systems losing, using these strategies and to actually mandate equity whenever possible. So committees you know, have to be 50% female. They have to include underrepresented minority groups. We went to the evidence to look at how do we root out biases and Dr. Spinks Franklin talked very eloquently about the implicit bias in the job application process. And so we know that many times people are looking for uh, someone that's like them. And that often leaves out women and leaves out people from uh, underrepresented minority groups. So we have to look at how that process can be disrupted in order for us to have a different outcome. And then people have to be able to be heard. When we um, measure equity otherwise, we're looking at salary equity analysis. We're looking at rates of promotion. We're looking at all of these uh, elements to determine whether or not our systems are set out to promote equity. Education and awareness is really the foundation of what we're trying to do. We need to build the capacity of people in our institution to even engage uh, in the conversations as uh, was outlined in the earlier presentation, people are uncomfortable talking about specifically race. Uh, it's almost a, it's someone, when I first started this work, it's like that's the third rail of you know, diversity, but it's really central because race and racism and they, uh, is really what this country is um, really built upon, the backs of this country is built upon uh, slavery and the legacy of slavery and Jim Crow segregation and all of the social uh, determinants that were outlined in the previous conversation. So we have to build our ability to engage and then provide support for communities. Visible support allow people to build community within the institution. I don't know if you have a, a memory or a recollection of being sort of the only one in an environment and that is very isolating. So we seek to build community, provide visibility of individuals so that to counteract people feeling like they're an imposter or feeling like they don't really belong in our environment. And we have a structure both top down and bottom up of how we engage with campus communities. So I support 
um, disability, disability Inclusion Committee, LGBT, across the campus, these committees are um, representative of students, our faculty, and our staff. And we want to make sure that um, people are being, being heard. And again, as I said, we measure the climate. Specific in initiatives to improve the demographic diversity have focused on actual process improvement for faculty hiring, incentivizing faculty hiring, requiring that all faculty who are, um, who are applying to positions at UCSF have to include a contributions to diversity statement because UCSF has identified that diversity is a strength. And we therefore want all members who come to our campus to understand that this is really foundational to who we are as an institution. And we wanna hear from them about their past uh, activities, but what they're gonna to contribute to our campus if hired on as faculty. And similarly, we are now introducing that to our some of our staff recruitments uh, and looking at our learners in a way that is holistic in the admissions process that doesn't just rely on these tests, um, but looks at their journey to get to where they are. So despite these efforts, when we look at our faculty, um, we have um, a black faculty population that is 3% uh, of our faculty. However, the numbers have actually more than doubled in the last 10 years. And similarly for our Hispanic faculty at 6% for UCSF, but more than doubled in the last 10 years. Together, we are slightly higher than the national average where it's about 5% if you combine all of our underrepresented minority faculty, Black, Hispanic, uh, Native American, Alaskan Natives. So we're making um, progress. When we look more broadly at our institution, we know that the majority of our institution is in this front line, excuse me, this front line. These are our staff working in our hospital across our system. As I said, we're 30,000 people, while 20,000 of them are in this front line. And it is a very diverse group. We are 40% Asian, 33% white, and you can see here Hispanic 4%, 14%, 8%. Uh, African-American um, Black. But as you move sort of up in the hierarchy of the leadership of the institution, you can see that if um, you're white, you have an increasing opportunity to move into a potentially a higher levels of the organization, but certainly diminishing if you're from any other minority group. We have here though at the senior le level, 18% um, um, African-Americans, um, which is uh, higher than the overall representation. So this new imperative um, really speaks to what we've all known. I mean, Dr. Spinks Franklin spoke to the, to the fact that of course, um, racism in this country is the legacy again of this country. Um, but after the murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery and others this summer, there was a, a, a call that happened across the nation, but also happened here uh, at UCSF, at our children's hospital. Our nurses um, stepped out to speak to this. Our nurses, our uh, staff um, stepped out to speak to this. Our students um, at our medical center at Mission Bay, they joined in marches, they stood up um, for a calling upon our institution um, to be responsive to um, the needs of the black community specifically. P uh, Pediatrics in Fresno and our cancer center uh, similarly. All in all, this call to action um, came to the leaders of this institution in a number of ways. We received over 20 letters uh, from various groups on our campus. And the, the six um, sort of the themes that emerged in those calls to action are for us to come together as a, an institution with great um, power and privilege to call out the crises um, of police violence and how it disproportionately impacts African-American communities, to address issues specifically in our own security and policing practices around bias, um, to demand that there be this foundational training, again, to facilitate our ability to actually even engage in these conversations such that all members of our community understand um, th some foundational concepts that around diversity, equity, and inclusion. We also recognize that there is an incredible need 
for healing and wellness. Yes, as a black person in this country, it is um, nearly impossible to get to adulthood without having experienced some racialized trauma. And the triggering of the impacts of the current events, um, triggering the response to your own racialized trauma is an important aspect for us to focus on as an institution. We had with the COVID pandemic built a COPE program around providing the kind of healing and wellness that providers caring for COVID patients needed. And I went to the program and said, we have a lot of suffering in our minority campus members because of this racial issues happening. And we didn't have a, a body of providers culturally congruent who could actually provide the kind of care. So we set about to really change that uh, on our campus. And then how do we think about incidents of biases that happen here in a fashion that we can do restorative justice and, and help facilitate healing of our members along our mission areas, certainly in education. We are creating the next generation of providers, nursing, dentistry, pharmacy, medicine, physical therapy. These are uh, individuals who will lead our health systems and our health centers and care for our patients uh, across the country. And it's imperative upon us as an institution to make sure that the curriculum is one in which we talk explicitly about how racism shows up in healthcare. How does racism show up and how you as a provider need to have an awareness of where your blind spots are? Where is it that your unconscious uh, or implicit bias show up in the ways in which you care differentially for patient populations? And how can you learn to advocate um, for the needs of your patients? Uh, similarly, in our own healthcare institutions, developing uh, health equity councils and looking very specifically at outcomes of our patient populations disaggregated by race, ethnicity is an important uh, aspect as well as in our research in which we need to both diversify the participants in our clinical research, but also the researchers who are doing um, this work. Again, here BIPOC uh, promoting hiring development and advancement of our own faculty and our own uh, staff and always having an accountability structure that allows you to hold yourself accountable and continue to push forward um, to an additional um, uh, greater equity. I won't spend time here. I think Dr. Dr. Spinks Franklin did an exquisite job of defining um, the critical nature of racism and that is the challenge. This is not um, about race, it's really about the impacts of racism. Um, you know, and the challenge in medicine, and this was a recent um, uh, podcast that was held by a deputy editor of the journal from the American Medical Association. And in this, he said that no physician is racist. So how can there be structural racism in healthcare? I mean, I was flabbergasted. The podcast was two white males. In fact, one of them being Dr. Mitch Katz, who was the former director of public health in San Francisco and with whom I've worked with for years, uh, sat in this podcast and sort of made these um, just completely wrong uh, statements. And there was a huge uh, outcry. The AMA uh, denounced uh, the, the podcast, you know, and the deputy director was in fact uh, let go. But this really speaks to the challenges we have because until people can sort of own it, um, have the awareness about it, it, it's very difficult to move towards um, structured sustainable change if in fact people are not even willing to admit that there is a problem. And when we look at the literature as it relates to the bias within healthcare, both implicit or unconscious bias and explicit bias, one study um, that uh, Dr. Sabin uh, led looking at physicians' implicit and explicit attitudes about race um, based on their own race and ethnicity, they found that the implicit preference for white Americans was strong among all MD groups except for African-American physicians. 
that white physicians showed the strongest implicit preference for whites and African Americans on average did not show an implicit preference for either white Americans um, or black Americans. And the implicit association test is a measure of one's bias, implicit bias. And I would encourage any, all of you to, at your own desk, go online and look at implicit.harvard.edu. Take the implicit association test to gain that awareness to where your own biases are. Because in fact, doctors um, and other healthcare providers with implicit bias, it actually shows up in the ways in which they care for or not care for patient populations. Cancer uh, oncologists, they looked at oncologists and in fact, those who have implicit bias, um, white uh, oncologists spend less time with black patients, less reassuring uh, in talking about cancer diagnoses and treatment options, less treatment of pain in children who are black because of, of biases in the ways in which physicians um, show up in this space. And so we have to actually address the specific need for our institutions to be anti-racism. And this, I, I, uh, Dr. Kinde, Ibram Kinde, in his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, talks very specifically about the fact that we can't be neutral on this because neutral is, is complicit because neutral is the status quo. And we know that the status quo, in fact, is racist. It is systemically um, racist in nature. So what we need people to do is to have an understanding of how that has played out and in fact seek to be anti-racist, seek to look specifically at policies, procedures, and practices and start to dismantle, you know, this is just the way we've always done it. This is, you know, I feel like this person's a good fit. You have to challenge um, the status quo. And that's what we're doing at UCSF. So specifically with our anti-racism initiative, valuing black lives and dismantling systemic um, inequities, we sought to take again, a very comprehensive and intersectional approach to the aspects of um, places in which um, the racism shows up and how we can counter uh, implement countermeasures. Starting with looking at the sort of the state of blacks at UCSF, doing an equity analysis, reviewing data on layoffs, there's national data of disproportionate, you know, terminations of black, you know, last one hired, first one fired. Looking at that, what are our resources around resiliency and wellness for communities who are suffering from post-traumatic stress? We have professional students, we have individuals who are expected to be providing care and, and, and really performing at a, an exceptional level who themselves are experiencing so much trauma and how can we be responsive, more responsive to their needs, critically important. I chair, I co-chair the policing uh, safety uh, task force um, here at UCSF with Dan Lowenstein looking at changing the way in which we um, police in a, an environment of higher education and within our health system. A lot of work on our foundational training. And who are we inviting to campus for our lectures of distinguished lectures? Um, what is the face of, of the work that we're putting forward? What is the Chancellor's Leadership Series look like? All of those things are being examined and re-examined. Um, and then of course, focusing on our, our climate. Um, when do we start to tell more truth and do some more reconciliation about the history of our uh, institution um, as it relates to uh, racism? Um, within human resources across our academic realm and in the research uh, arena, again, looking across all of aspects of the institution. And to date, we have done a number of things as it relates to our safety task force and security policing at UCSF, changing our security officers to wayfire, way, wayfinders. There are individuals who are here to assure your safety and to facilitate your sense of belonging. They're not um, junior police, and so they are going to be changed to campus um, safety ambassadors. Uh, and be trained around issues of um, customer service uh, and rather than in a sort of typical policing uh, model. We've uh, implemented an, a mandatory training 
to again to establish the foundational floor upon which to build some additional trainings. All of our schools um, in our graduate division have engaged in anti-racism elements of their curriculum. And um, again, advancing how we um, select faculty and staff. We are an anchor institute, meaning that UCSF 150 years, we've been in the city and county of San Francisco. We are a $7 billion annual budget. We are an anchor to this city. We're the second largest employer. So what is our obligation to the members of our, our immediate um, environment as far as job opportunities, career opportunities for education and training at our institution? How are we spending the billion dollars that we spend in procuring you know, everything from paper clips to paper? Um, is it all at big, big box stores or how do we support the local community for black uh, own businesses, women owned businesses and others. And so thinking very uh, intentionally about spending our money to support our local community and taking part of our endowment and actually investing it with some of our community-based organizations. Um, examining the use of race, why does race show up in medicine in the ways in which it does? And so we have a, a series of symposia with experts uh, focusing on that. We are specifically trying to establishing research diversity initiatives around how changing the curriculum impacts um, the caregiver experience. I mean, there are a number of research uh, initiatives and then healing from racial trauma uh, and continuing to look intersectionally. So I alluded to the all of the groups, uh, the women's group, the LGBT group, the disability inclusion group, asking them to look intersectional, intersectionally how does racism show up in the disability community, which is you know, our topic here? How does racism show up in the, in the work of the Committee on the, committee on the Status of Women? And all of the committees have been working um, heartily on this over the course of the, the last um, year. The Office of Diversity and Outreach takes a yes and approach while we're focused uh, really aggressively on the anti-racism work. Our reach and our Responsibilities are quite broad uh, in that we seek to eliminate all forms of oppression and discrimination um, at UCSF and even to lead across health science uh, campuses across the country. And therefore our work is really um, broad and inclusive and the disability inclusion work um, again includes the sponsorship of the Disabilities Inclusion Committee. We're adding additional ADA resources for our campus. We're building a lot of buildings at UCSF and of course universal design is critically important but again holding all of ourselves accountable for that um, physically, electronically um, and then working with our health equity council so on specific me metrics as it relates to our patient population um, with disabilities and then, of course, our climate survey, which we'll be um, doing again in the fall of 2021. So our planning um, includes some additional comprehensive wellness and healing. We recognize the, the dearth of providers who have the kind of cultural um, congruency and the cultural sensitivities to work with our community. So we're trying to build those relationships and facilitate additional training opportunities for individuals. And we're looking to develop a research institute for racial justice in health and science to, to, to you do what UCSF does really well, which is to um, apply um, scientific rigor to looking at the ways in which um, we can effectively dismantle some of the patterns of racism and, and injustice. And so that is our, our big push for the future of what UCSF can do and can contribute to health science um, here and across the, the country.